The message on why should Christians support Israel is something that has been brewing within me for the longest time because unfortunately, I see either Christians that are completely ignorant of what the Bible says regarding Israel or they are so much on steroids for the love for Israel that they actually love and support Israel in their own way. And so I thought it'll be good if I address that issue for most Christians. They need to know why they should support Israel. And they need to know how also they should be supporting Israel. And not just because, you know, the Bible tells them so. And then going ahead and doing it in the wrong way. So um, we're going to start with, um, with the understanding, first of all, that... Um, the uh, Word of God is clearly indicating that Israel is definitely a nation that the Lord has uh, chosen for a reason and also, by the way, for a season. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the deception regarding Israel all across the church in America and all over the world is a deception that can easily be traced back to Genesis chapter 3 and on. What causes, this, I mean, I was asking myself so many questions. You know how many text messages and emails I get with the F word? And uh, every morning I get those kind of uh, good morning messages. One of them, <laughs> one of them uh, a couple weeks ago was, uh, it went beyond that. It was uh, from a, supposedly a Christian guy who believed that um, why don't we just nuke Israel and most of the problems of the world will be solved. So I thought it's, uh, instead of answering him the same way, I should just teach <laughs> on why should Christians support Israel. Um, but really, what is the thing that causes so many so-called Christ followers. What's a Christian, a Christ follower? To stand against Israel today. It's very interesting. They stand against Israel today. They think that Israel today is something you can stand against and fight and, and boycott and, 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 and trash. And it's completely different than the Israel of the Bible. They think that there's a big difference between the two. And it's interesting because... How come Israel of the Bible was accepted, yet the modern-day Israel isn't? It's very interesting that they completely miss out that which God has done with Israel, even in the last 70 years. And they think that modern-day Israel is actually something different. It's interesting because uh, there is a, a prominent Bible teacher um, from the United States, and... Uh, he actually wrote in an article that the promises made to Abraham, including the promise of the land, and it will be inherited as an everlasting gift only by true spiritual Israel, not disobedient, oblivion, uh, unbelieving Israel. And then he continued saying, by faith in Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, Gentiles become heirs of the promise of Abraham, including the promise of the land. And he continued, therefore, the secular state of Israel today may not claim a present divine right to the land. But they and we should seek a peaceful settlement not based on present divine rights, but on international principle of justice, mercy, and practical feasibility. It's baloney with mayo. And it's kosher baloney. <laughs> Let me tell you... Um, this is exactly the root of the problem. When you take away divine rights and divine calling and godly uh, destination, and you insert and inject into the language today the international principle of justice, mercy, and practical feasibility and we know where the world is we know what turns what the world turned into we know exactly what is justice to the world is for babies not to be born for justice to the world is for uh, is for um, you know using democracy to destroy democracy justice you see the justice that we have in the world today is 
every day becoming more and more completely opposite of the Word of God. So what is the spiritual? Because there is a spiritual root to this hatred. You don't have to go back to the deception in Genesis 3. And you have to understand almost everything we go, we go through today has to do with these verses that you're about to read from Genesis 3 verses 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord has made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. She corrected him. She said, hey, no, 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 that's not what he said. He said, we may eat the fruit of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. He just warned us. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruits and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. You see that from the moment free will was granted to humanity, Deception was taking advantage of it. And deception will not tell you exactly what God said. As we could see, we, we just read what pastor says about Israel. Deception will suggest something almost similar, but not exactly. And then he inserted the most important thing. You need to know that God doesn't want you to eat from it because He's afraid that you will be like God. So I'm here to tell you, go ahead. You will not die. In other words, you will be like God. When we decide to take the role of God and, and take from Him the promises, take from Him the ordinances that He promised and, and all of those things, that's when we make our own things. That's when we become even Christian leaders that start teaching things that have absolutely no base in the scriptures. The truth is, Genesis 12, now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless him, those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that's the truth. This is the word of God spoken by the Lord through Abraham when he started all things new after the flood and after the Tower of Babel. And that's now the way God is approaching mankind. Through one man and a promise that through a seed from a specific line, a lineage, he is going to create a nation. Not nations. Abraham was known as the father of all nations. But one nation will be the one through which God will bless the rest of them. Now, you all know that when the children of Israel were wandering in the desert, they were a non-believing nation. Let's, let's face it. At no point they were all greatly appreciating everything God has done for them. But did that change God's mind on what he's about to do with them? Absolutely not. And in fact, all of their enemies couldn't understand how come they are so outnumbered they don't have a clue how to fight. These are ex-slaves in Egypt. They don't have the right weapon. They don't have anything. Yet, every battle, they win. And so one of them, the king of Moab, Balak, reckoned it must be a spiritual thing. I, I, probably I cannot fight them in the natural. I should understand that it's the spiritual 
He was smart enough to identify the spiritual battle, but yet he was foolish enough to stand against the God of Israel. And he hired someone to curse Israel because in the spiritual realm, that's the only way he can fight them and, and go to battle with them. So who did he hire? Whom did he hire? Balaam. Exactly. Now, we know that in Numbers 23, verses 7 to 12, Balaam is standing on the mountain. And he took up his oracle and he said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. But then he said, but how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him. And from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone. Not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Or number one fourth of Israel. Let me die in death of the, right, uh, the death of the righteous. And let my end be like his. And then Balak said to Balaam. What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies. And look you have blessed them bount bountifully. And so he answered and said. Must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? The battle was there from day one. To curse them, to destroy them, to eradicate them. God had one thing in mind, the people had another thing in mind. And the battle to destroy Israel had nothing to do with Israel. It had to do with God. It's a, coming against the God of Israel. Just like in the Garden of Eden, in chapter 3 of Genesis, Israel did not exist as a nation. It's the God of Israel. It's the creator of heavens and earth that was the problem of Satan. And how do you get him? By destroying that which is his. There is no place in the Bible where it says the God of the United States. My name is the God of America. Now he is the God of all the world. But the only nation he used as a way to describe himself is Israel. So what do we do in order to fight him? We go after them. It's very, very easy. How can anyone curse that which God blessed? You have to understand the name of God is on the line here. In 1 Kings chapter 8, when Solomon dedicated the newly built temple, Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands towards heaven, and he said, Lord God of Israel. There is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you. You keep your covenant and mercy with your servants. You walk before you, uh, 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 your servant who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled with your hand as it, uh, it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, that's his name. Now keep. What you promised your servant David, my father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. Only if your sons take heed of their way, that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. In chapter 18, then Elijah, Mount Carmel, he said to the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the numbers of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whom the Lord said, uh, the, the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near. And he said, and look how Elijah in the sight of the prophets of Asherah and the prophets of Baal and a terrible king of Israel called, ah uh, called uh, Ahab and his wife Jezebel. He says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, 
and Israel, he said. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. God is saying to the people of Israel, look. That's my name. I'm your God. I don't change. I never change my name. And that is why Israel will be saved. <laughs> that is why they will never be completely destroyed. I'm telling now to the mullahs in Iran and to the congresswomen from Somalia and from the palace. I'm telling all of them right now, Israel will never ever be consumed or destroyed. Not because we are good and not because we are perfect. It's because the Lord God of Israel, that's his name and he never changes and therefore the, the sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. It's, look, if you have a problem with that, talk to him. In Matthew 15, now people come and say, oh, well, you know, but you're in the Old Testament. You only quote Old Testament, but New Testament is New Testament, different. No. Well, Matthew 15 says, Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then the great multitudes came to him, and having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, and many, and many others, and then... They laid them down at Jesus' feet and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking and the main made whole and the lame walking and the blind and the blind seeing. And they what? Glorified. Glorified the God that is no longer the God of Israel. Absolutely not. It's the old and it's in the new and it's the same God. He cannot and he will not change. And he is the God of Israel. Amen. Acts 13, when Paul and, and, Timothy, when, and, and Timothy, when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. And then they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God. Here he is in the synagogue. He knows these people might throw him out of the synagogue in just a few minutes. <laughs> but he says this, Men of Israel, and he, those who fear God, the God of this people Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelled in st as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it now for a time of about 40 years he put up with their ways in the wilderness and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan he distributed their land to them by allotment Paul says look whether you want it or not it's the same God that same God of these people, Israel. And he's the one who chose the fathers. And he's the one who led them out of Egypt. And he's the one. And even though he put up with their ways in the wilderness, even though they were not that great. Look, that pastor that said what he said, he looks at things in the perspective of the people of Israel today are not that godly. Well, were they godly in the desert? And you have to understand, it's not only the name of God on the line here, it's the identity of the Messiah around him. John chapter 4, Jesus said to her, woman, believe in me. He's telling to the Samaritan woman, believe in me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Now look what Jesus says to the Samaritan woman. He tells the Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. And look what he says then. We, can you say that? We know what we worship. Naming, he is actually what? Talking as a, as a Jew. As son of Israel. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But then of course he comes and gives her the good news of the New Testament. The good news of the great message. 
The hour is coming and is now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ, anointed one, Christos. And when He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you. First, he introduced himself as a Jew. We know what we worship. And then he said, well, now since we are now celebrating the solution for sin, the Holy Spirit is now going to come into every believer, whether Gentile or Jew. I'm telling you, I'm the Messiah. And I'm telling you, if you worship God in spirit and in truth, regardless where you think the temple could have and should have been, that's what God wants. And Jesus came to the world as a Jew. I don't know if you know that, but uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright said uh, that Jesus is uh, the first Palestinian. I don't know which Bible he reads from, but Luke chapter 2, 21 says, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus in the Hebrew, Yeshua, which means salvation, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49, regarding Jacob, the promise of Jacob, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, it's the name of God, of, of the Messiah, Shiloh, comes, and to him shall be obedience of the people. And in Luke 2, 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Jesus is the branch from the stem of Jesse. Isaiah 11, Jesus quoted that in Nazareth, in that synagogue. He read the this, now, he read Isaiah 61, which is in, in first person, but the third person, Isaiah 11, says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The okay, Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of knowledge. And then, excuse me. Okay, the spirit, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and on the fear of the Lord, the seven spirits of God. And you can see that. And then, of course, his delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the side of his. This is, of course, about Messiah. Because he said that when he read it in Isaiah 61 and that scenario. Today, this scripture is fulfilled before your very ears, hearing and eyes. Jesus was also dedicated in the temple, not in a mosque, and not in a Catholic church, and not in a Hindu temple. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, not the city of Yasser Arafat. Jesus was dedicated in the temple, not in the Al-Aqsa mosque. And then, of course... When the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what it is says in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Jesus preached in synagogues on the Sabbath. Not in mosque on Friday or churches on Sunday. There were no churches in those days. There were no mosques in those days. And he could have easily, if you want to compare it to other foreign religions or foreign uh, whatever. I mean, there were Greek temples and there were Roman temples. Yet, he preached where? In synagogues. He preached on the Sabbath day. Luke 4, 14 to 6. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit of Galilee. And news of him went throughout all surrounding regions. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And so he's, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read as his custom was. Not the first time. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5, 5. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. When John was in heaven, when John was brought up to heaven, John, on chapter 4, verse 1, he was taken up to heaven. By the way, that's where we believe the rapture takes place in the book of Revelation. And he wept. 
And by the way, that's why I believe that none of the seals is open yet. If we believe that chapter 4, verse 1 speaks of the rapture, and chapter 5, the seals have not been opened yet, then, of course, we're not yet living in the days of the seals open. But nobody could understand who can open the seals. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the stem of Jesse, we just read, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And it's not Mecca or Medina or New York City or Salt Lake City that Jesus is going to return to. <laughs> Jesus will return to Jerusalem. And Jesus will return as the Bible says in Zechariah 14. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations that come against Israel. That come against Jerusalem. And as he fights in the day of battle. And that day his feet will stand on Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east. Jesus will return only. Say only. Only, only when his people are ready. Because a lot of people, including that pastor, oh, Israel is, is, is adulterous, Israel is, is ungodly. Well, no, he will come back and he will save them when they are ready. Because Jesus said to Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Until you say, blessed is you, come in the name of the Lord, you will not see me. And at the end of the tribulation, seven years the first three and a half years, Israel will be completely deceived to think that this is the Messiah, to think that this is a true temple, to think this is a true service of God. And then at the half time, when he shows his true face, when he walks into the temple and demands to be worshipped as if he is God, they understand the big mistake and they, do, they say, I'm sorry, but we do not worship you. And then he will run after them and he will chase after them. And they will go and run and flee into the desert as Revelation 12 says. And the Bible says that the Lord will take care of them. And he will place them in a place where he will sustain them and prepare for them for 1260 days. The last three and a half years. Israel will be sheltered. And when Jesus comes and they will of course wait for him to come back. When they're ready. When I always say look the Tribulation is for Israel's salvation. We're out of here. Israel is still here as a nation. They're going to lose Jerusalem. The Bible says Jesus comes back because Jerusalem was divided and conquered and trampled over by all those other people. They're going to lose sovereignty because the Antichrist is going to reign from Jerusalem. They're going to lose democracy because they're no longer in the country. Their army will be no good anymore. They can't, I mean... Everything they have right now will be lost. They'll be in the desert, kept for three and a half years. And they're ready. Of course, those who will receive the mark of the beast, those who will be part of the Antichrist will perish. This is why the Bible says in Zechariah 13, two-thirds of Israel will perish. Only the last 30 will bring through the fire. Matthew 23 Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophet and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you children together as a hand gatherer chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to, the de to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And even on the cross... When it was the easiest thing to do, to curse them, he never cursed them. Interesting, you know, 2 Chronicles 6.25, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel. Then bring them back to the land which you gave to them and their fathers. In Luke 23.34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided then his garments and cast lots. And Jesus is not... Imam or a, some sort of a priest. The Bible says Jesus is a king and a high priest. And these, these offices are Old Testament embedded. And the only king that ever held the two offices together was a type of the Messiah. Was Melchizedek if you remember. 
In Hebrews 7, 1 to 3, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth. Part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Shalem, Salem, meaning the king of peace, without father, without a mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Jesus is a high priest and a king at the same time. And he's not necessarily of the root of Aaron, of the lineage of the Kohanim, of the Levites. No, he is from the tribe of Judah. And his kingdom and his priesthood is of a different order, in the order of Melchizedek. Is there any distinction between a Jew and a Gentile in Christ? Is there any difference between me and you right now? The answer is no. <laughs> Romans 10, 11 to 13. But the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between a Jew and a Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen. You see, the problem is people try to tell you. That there is a difference between a Jew and a Gentile in Christ. No. And you better not wish that I will stay throughout the tribulation. Because I'm not planning on it. <laughs> Galatians 3, 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither a Jew nor a Greek. There is neither a slave nor free. There is neither a male nor a female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus we are all one. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and, they, and heirs according to the promise. You see, before God, in Christ, we're the same. But don't mix the apart from Christ. Colossians 3 continues, says, Do not lie to one another since you have all put all the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is now renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So in Christ Jesus, before the Lord, when we accept Christ as Jews or Gentiles, we are the same. I agree. However, <laughs> is there any distinction between a Jew and a Gentile apart from Christ? You understand in Christ... We have no difference. When a Jew becomes a believer in Jesus, him and you are the same. You're not less and he's not more. But when we look at the rest of the world and what God is doing with Israel, apart from Christ, is there any distinction? Absolutely there is. And that's where that pastor is wrong. The Bible says in Exodus 33, 15 to 16, then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us. This is when Moses was so disappointed that God says, look, uh, you can continue from here. I'll send my, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send my, my presence. And then he says, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? And look what he says then. So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. You created us to be different. You, you, you made us to stand out. Through us, people should see that there is God. Through us, people should receive the word of God. Through us, people should receive the son of God. How can you expect us to be different if you're not with us? If you're not planning on being with us, we're not moving. Italian strike. 
And Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Again, if you think that there is no distinction, there is. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what if it is a prophet of circumcision? Look what he says. Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Is the unfaithfulness of the Jewish people today makes the faithfulness of God to bring them back to their land without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. In Romans 9, 1 to 5, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. This is the first and the only time I know that Paul was using such a strong language to convince the people that what he's about to say is not his idea. It's not his thing. It's absolutely the heart of God, the word of God, the spirit of God, the will of God. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my country men according to the flesh who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the service, of, the service of God and the promises of whom are their fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. He says there is a great advantage but they are blind and I wish if I could be a curse just so they will see, I wish that could happen. But none of you can replace someone else. Jeremiah 31. This is what I need to tell the mullahs in Iran. And I'm telling the mullahs and not the Iranians because I believe most Iranians don't even agree with them. I say... Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night. Who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. In other words, as long as the stars are there and the moon is there and the sun is there, Israel is a nation before God. It cannot be changed. It will not change. And the only time it will change, it's by the way, the answer is here. When there will no longer be any need for what? The moon, the stars, and the sun. <laughs> when he will make all things new. New heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem. The Bible says new Jerusalem needs no sun. Who is illuminating the new Jerusalem? Christ. He is the menorah. Then, and only then, Israel will no longer stand before God because there is no need to. Ladies and gentlemen, if the mullahs wants to destroy Israel, they should take their rockets and aim them towards the moon, the stars, and the sun. <laughs> because only when they will be gone, Israel will no longer there. You have to understand, through Israel, through Israel... Certain things the Lord said, did through, through Israel, God is testing the nations. You know, be, be, before I started teaching around the world, God clearly showed to me that everywhere you go, the way they teach on Israel will explain to you how they teach the rest of the Word of God. If they ignore Israel, if they deny Israel, they will ignore and deny many other parts in the Scriptures. Through Israel, God tests the nations. Isaiah 43, fear not for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Bring out all of them and then let all the nations be gathered together and let all the people be assembled who among them can declare this and show us former things let them bring out their witnesses and let and 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 and, and they may be justified or let them hear and say is it truth you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant from uh, uh, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Right. 
Israel is the way God communicates to the rest of the world that he is God. Through Israel, God blessed the nations. Isaiah 49, verses 5 and 6. And now the Lord says, who formed me. And we already heard that. He promised that to Abraham. Through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Who formed me from the womb of his servant to bring Jacob back to him. So that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. And my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is it is." Too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the perverse ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles and that you should be my salvation uh, to the end of the earth. I want to tell you something. Israel, and it's, look, what the next slide is very fine print. I don't even expect you to be able to read all of this. But after the... Um, in 1958, after visiting poverty-stricken nations in Africa, Prime Minister Golda Meir committed Israel to helping alleviate hunger, disease, and poverty in developing countries. In 1995, a special humanitarian emergency aid unit was developed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Israel's Defense Forces for that purpose. The unit has carried out operations in Kenya, Albania, Mexico, Congo, Haiti, Japan, and Nepal, to, to name only a few. In addition to often being uh, first on the scene of a disaster, this unit provides emergency medical care with state-of-the-art equipment and highly trained medical specialists under the most extreme conditions. Often, when the mission is complete and the Israelis head for home, the equipment is left behind for use by local medical personnel. But that's not all. After the recent medical mission to Nepal, the Roof for All program was established to provide um, rudimentary housing for the thousands of displaced families who had lost everything in two devastating earthquakes. The unit also holds eye camps in several nations where Israeli ophthalmologists optom treat hundreds of patients annually for preventable blindness and ocular disease. Special operations are sometimes undertaken when Israel becomes aware of a critical need. In June 2015, 500 people were severely burned when an explosion ripped through a water park in Taipei, in Taiwan. Weeks later, 400 of them were still hospitalized, 200 of them in serious condition requiring a skin graft. Israel organized the donation of two state-of-the-art machines used for making and meshing skin for grafting onto patients' injuries, as well as training Taiwanese doctors in their use. In other areas, medicine... Uh, so it's in other areas of medicine, Israel is the world leader from the pill uh, cam, a tiny camera in pill form that takes uh, uh, scans of the entire di digestive system to incredibly hopeful developments in cancer treatment, antibiotics, to innovation in the treatment of MS and diabetes. Israel is blessing the nations with better health and longer life and for realize Few realize that in December 2014, Israel took the international lead in the fight against Ebola, providing several fully equipped medical clinics in disease-stricken African countries, as well as deploying infectious disease experts to train local professionals. I could go on and on. You see what's going on. And through Israel, God demonstrates his jealousy when he is forsaken. Let's not hide that truth. In Deuteronomy 4, 26 to 31, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. See, God says, look, I want everyone to know that if you walk in my ways, you'll be dwelling in the land of promise. But if you're not, you bring upon yourself destruction and judgment. And through Israel, God demonstrated his forgiveness. The Jews rejected Christ, yet he asked God to forgive them. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself 
as a house of sacrifice. And when I shut up heaven and, three, and, and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and return from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Israel demonstrated to the world God's forgiving nature. Not only that, has God changed his mind about Israel after all the promises he gave them that he's going to bring them back to the land? Is the New Testament offering a new God? Romans 11 says, I say then, has God cast away his people? And the answer is, certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Psalm 94, 14. For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. 1 Samuel 12, 22. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Now, can one love and support Israel yet still be wrong? Absolutely. And I want you Gentiles. How many of you here are Gentiles, by the way? <laughs> All right. How many of you are Jews? Yeah. Mm. One. All right. Good. <laughs> Can one love and support Israel yet still be wrong? Absolutely. If you suggest what we call dual covenant. You know what a dual covenant is? It means you suggest that. There are two different covenants, and therefore, for the Gentiles, it's through Jesus, and to Israel, there's something else. And I want to tell you, folks, it is to the Jewish people that Jesus himself, Yeshua, the Messiah, said, unless one is born, what? Again. John 3, 3, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It is... In the prophet Isaiah, not in the New Testament, that God says that through him, the sins, through his death only, the sins of the world can be dealt with. There's another problem. Hebrew roots and going back to the law. So many Gentiles, from some reason, wants to become Jews. Then they criticize me. For having certain thing for breakfast. <laughs> Listen. The Bible does not show us even a single case. Neither in the old nor in the new. Of someone who was ever saved by keeping the law. In fact the Bible tells us no one can keep the law. The law is holy. And if you break one as if you broke all. The only one that fulfilled the law is. Because he had no sin. No one who is a sinner, and everyone are born sinner, is even able. To. God did not give us the law so we can complete the law. And we can, the law was what? It was a mirror for you to understand that you need a Savior. That you cannot do it by yourself. So what is it that some people do? They suggest that the Gentiles should start keeping the law. They tell them, well, you need to be, and then you need to do that. And you, it's Jesus plus movement. Should believe in him plus do this, do this, do this, do this, and this. It's interesting because the Bible says in Romans 11, through their fall, in order to provoke them to jealousy, salvation was given to the Gentiles. So many Christians are being provoked to jealousy rather than provoke Israel to jealousy. And of course, the number one sign of, uh, of, of um, a cult is... Denying the deity of Christ. Jewish people rejected Jesus not as Messiah. By the way, they have no problem. Never ever Jesus said, I'm the Messiah, and he was stoned for that. What was the problem they had with him? Equating himself to God. That was the blasphemy. They couldn't live with that one. Because they didn't understand the concept that God, although it's in the Old Testament, the book of Mishlei, the book of Proverbs says... Who has ascended to heaven and who has descended? Who has gathered water in his face? What's his name and what's his son's name? You shall know. <laughs> the Bible said that. 
The Bible talks about in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, Yeshayahu, he says, Unto us a son is given. And he speaks of the names of God, wonderful counsel, almighty God, everlasting father. And then what? In order to be liked by the establishment, they deny the deity of Christ. It's the most important thing is being denied. Now, are the Gentiles indebted to Israel? Now all of you are sitting like that. <laughs> oh, I never heard of that. Well, open your Bible to Romans 15, 25 to 27. Paul is telling the people that he's going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors, he says. Why? For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, of the Jewish spiritual things, what now? Their duty is also to minister to them now in material things. Oh, I never heard of that. Well, it's in the Bible, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, if I was a manipulator, I would have quoted this verse before the offering. <laughs> I mean, that's a, a lot of them do that. No, that should be said towards the end because that's the truth and you cannot run away from it. Oh, I don't like that verse. Well, <laughs> you have a problem with the Word of God then. Your stance on Israel matters. Being pro-Israel will cost you. Being pro-Israel re will reward you eternally. May not be on this earth, but it will reward you. And the reason is, it's in the Old and it's in the New Testament. When the Bible says God will judge all the nations, He will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Joel chapter 3, the prophet Joel, Joel in the English, it's chapter 3. In the Hebrew, it's the end of chapter 2. Don't know why you guys change it, but never mind. And he says, I'm going to bring all the nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the valley of Kidron in Jerusalem. And I will judge them according to how they treated my people and the land. He says, and I will enter into judgment with them there on the account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine and then and they may, that they may drink. Matthew 25 is the equivalence of Joel in the New Testament when Jesus says in chapter 25, in that portion, how the king will come and he will divide the sheep from the goats according to what they did to the least of his brethren. You cannot hate that which God loves or else you will end up love that which God hates. Isaiah 49, but Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on her son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. Zechariah 2, 8 and 9, for thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after the glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eyes. For surely I will shake my hand against them and they shall become spoiled for their servants. And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Psalm 17, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. And you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them, keep me as an apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me and from the deadly enemies who surround me. The church and Israel have a shared future. Israel will be saved at the very end. And because Israel has to be saved, and because Jesus will not come back until they will call upon his name and say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because of that, the Antichrist wants to destroy them. To prevent the second coming. The Antichrist is only after the saints 
and Israel. Shared destiny even throughout the tribulation. The saints of the tribulation, of course. And I will tell you this. One thing that bothers me a lot is that many Gentiles try to love Israel in a very awkward way. They use Israel to promote themselves. They use Israel to collect funds. They use Israel to make their name you know, greater. And Look, I want to tell you this. When you call to the children of God, to the people of God to support Israel, it has nothing to do with you and with your motives. It has all to do with the commandment of God. And that's it. You cannot use Israel to start promoting other things. And, and, and you know how many people I know that started nonprofits supposedly to bless Israel? They ended up blessing their bank account. I don't envy them. At the end of the tribulation, all Israel will be saved. And therefore, we remember, they are going to be together with the church, reigning for 1,000 years in the millennial kingdom. You better get along with them. <laughs> and I want you all to know, that the way you treat Israel is a way for God to see how you treat every other aspect of his word. If you start saying, this is not for me, yes, this is for me. This is not for me, this is for me. You'll do that with Israel. You'll do that with every other part of the Bible. Israel has been, is, and will be a nation before God that he will never leave nor forsake until the end when he will make all things new. And you have to understand, I never ever said a single time in my entire life that Israel will be saved without having to acknowledge the Messiah. In fact, when all Israel will be saved, it's because they looked at me whom they pierced in Zechariah chapter 12. And they looked at me whom they pierced and they will lament and cry, repent, and then they will be saved. So when Paul said all Israel will be saved, it's because of their trust in the Messiah when they recognize him whom they pierced. So Father, we thank you so much this morning for your word. Your word is truth and we only want to be sanctified by your truth. We thank you for the nation of Israel. We thank you that you have called all believers on planet earth to stand for Israel, fight for their right over their land, not because they are so righteous or not because they're so godly, but because you have a plan for them. You will deal with them. And you are the one who brought them back to their land. Yes, there are divine rights prescribed by you, because apart from Christ, there still is a great difference. Father, we thank you that in Christ there is no Jew, no Gentile, no Greek, no slave, no free man, no master. In Christ, we're all one. But the enemy is trying to confuse, deceive, and of course, stop your plan from being executed. And the best way has been in the past is in the present and maybe even in the future to eliminate Israel. Because Israel are your witnesses. And unless they accept you and call upon your name, you will not come back. So we thank you, Father, for your promises that are all yes and amen. We thank you that all the plans of the enemies will never, ever succeed. We thank you that they may can cause some embarrassment for a very short time. But in the long run, we know that our God reigns. He's on the throne. And he is the one that cannot change. Therefore, the seed of Jacob is not consumed. We bless your name this morning. 
And we thank you and we pray all of this in the matchless and the beautiful name of the Holy One of Israel, the promised Messiah through Zechariah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and so many others. In the name of Yeshua, our salvation, I pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.